Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining me here today on Fearless Ambition. I am so excited to bring today's guest and I thought what I would do is something a little bit different. I want to, I'm going to actually share my screen and what I'm going to do is pull up her book. Okay, I thought, here we go. I'm going to pull up her book. It's, okay, maybe I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I thought I could figure out how to do it, but I can't find the uh, Chrome button to be able to do that. Okay, so forget it. We're not doing that. I can okay. go grab it and hold it up. Let me do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. do that. Yeah. So if you're joining us today, I have with me Dr. Karen Ander Anderson Abril. She is a psychologist, an author, and a podcast host. She's a speaker and a musician. And I just think she has this really cute book called Black is the New White. I am sharing my screen? Okay. We're just stop doing that. <laughs> All right. My assistant let me know I was sharing the screen. So, okay. Oh, you did. Yep, I was, but I couldn't figure out how to get the book up. So, all right, Karen, go ahead and show us that beautiful book. Single is the new black. Don't wear white till it's right. So this is a book that uh, Dr. Karen wrote and it was published in 2015. And I think it's a very cute title. And actually one of the things she's doing today is giving that away free. So when we get to that part of it, if you want a free copy of that book and I confirmed with her, she's actually just going to mail you one. Um, that's so generous. I've never had a guest here on Fearless Ambition offer to do that before. So I'm super excited. And of course, I'm going to grab my my copy of it as well. So today we're going to be talking about getting happy. Um, we all experience these moments of happiness, but few of us figure out ways to maintain a positive blissful state. So in today's training, Dr. Karen is going to explain the get happy principles from cognitive therapy. The tools discussed are backed by research. So you know what that means? No woohoo. Uh, <laughs> And we're going to learn, and this is like why Dr. Karen and I are such great uh, partners for each other, because we both believe in science-backed research instead of just claiming that things work, that, you know, maybe they work for some people, but when you have scientific research behind it, we know that you can make steps towards living that um, happier life. So, all right, Dr. Karen, I'm just going to let you take it away. Okay, thanks Mary. I appreciate the opportunity to join you and your followers and talk about one of my favorite topics, getting happy. Because what I've learned from my years studying as a psychotherapist is that happiness is actually much more in our control than we think. We oftentimes, we say things like, oh, he made me so mad or that, that situation devastated me. And that's really not the way we should be phrasing our circumstances in our lives because when we do that we turn over the power to the external and we lose the power that is within us every day all day to take control of our emotional state and elevate our emotional well-being so it's a really important topic because i think a lot of people are running around not realizing they have the tools within them already and we live in a society that is very i think misinformed about emotions as well. So we have diagnostic inflation. So every time you feel down, someone's trying to give you a clinical depression diagnosis, or you're nervous to go to a party and someone says you have social anxiety, as if you have these very, very heavy duty psychiatric illnesses, which I would argue are actually, for the most part, just part of the normal range of human functioning and functioning in the human condition. Yes, we'd all love to hang out in the mountaintop 24 seven, but that's not realistic. And it's not expected to be a way that we could sustain our emotions anyway. And what we all know, if we have got a couple years under our belts, we all know that when we, when we do experience some down times, when we do have to handle grief and anger and loneliness and frustration, those are the periods where we grow the most. So we have to be mindful in this discussion that we aren't trying to say, okay, emotional wellness is never feeling bad ever. That's unrealistic, it's unsustainable, and it's not what the human condition is about. And it robs us of our growth. Mm -hmm. 
which is why it's problematic as a psychologist. My followers know I'm very concerned that in this day and age, we're very quick to medicate away every undesirable emotion, right? So it's like, oh, I'm feeling down for five minutes. I want to go and pop a pill. And the pharmaceutical corporations are very happy to <laughs> provide us with opportunities to do that, which again, we're putting Band-Aids on top of tumors. We're not getting into the root of that emotion, learning from it, and then also learning sustainable strategies from our mindset that can help us stay emotionally healthy and emotionally well. Yeah, I am so blown away right now. And I could not agree with you more because I know sometimes I feel like this lonely person who's out there saying like the positive psychology movement doesn't always serve us in the way like, yes, it's great to be positive. I totally agree with that. But when you're so focused on being positive all the time, it doesn't allow you to process your emotions when the shit hits the fan. And let's face it in life, the shit is going to hit the fan. And you're right. You don't have to have a, you know, like for example, if you are, you can experience a state of mind of depression because you are, um, because you're going through an extreme period of stress, you know, like right. when my daughter died, when, when some of the things that have happened in my life to cause me extreme depression, I felt a huge pressure from my family, actually, not from the medical doctors, because I wasn't really going to the doctor about it. Mm -hmm. um, but I felt a huge pressure from my family to take antidepressants. And there were a couple of times that I gave into that. And yes, I did feel better. Or yes, it did take the edge off. But long term, that was not the solution for me. What was the solution was to work through those problems. And I'm also curious, uh, Dr. Karen, uh, if you agree with me about this, that when you don't process the emotions, they get stuck in your body because our bodies are like libraries and they're, they're really um, storing everything that's ever happened to us. And if we don't process them, they get lodged. You know, they've always said the issues are in the tissues. So mm -hmm. they get lodged. And I believe that 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road, they begin to manifest into um, illness. Well, I would agree with you. We think of the mind as one entity and the body as a different entity, but you're right. It's one, the mind-body dualism is, is a sham. It's a farce. We are one entity. And so if we're not dealing with these emotional problems, I mean, think about it. When, when you're nervous to go to a party or something, you get butterflies where? In your stomach. I mean, you might be thinking nervous thoughts too, but you get a physiological response in your gut. So it's one body. And so yes, Problems can manifest all kinds of places. We know that people who don't deal with their psychological state definitely are more likely to have physical ailments. I mean, of course, this is something that's so important to consider. And so, yes, to take time to process what's going on, being in touch with our emotions, absolutely, and then trying to deal with them with the wherewithal that you have, with your cognitive abilities, and then make steps that are sustainable, like you said, as opposed to just well, I don't feel good, so let me just pop a pill so I can feel better tomorrow, which, of course, the research is very uh, misleading as well because not everyone feels better tomorrow when they're on an antidepressant. Oftentimes, it's a placebo effect at work, but that's another conversation. But yeah, we need to be looking at delving into, processing, and then moving on. But we can't, we, you know, we can't rush that. We can't rush that experience. I was uh, just listening to a podcast uh, the other day. I think it was on Sunday while I was going for a walk. It was uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza talking about that very thing, saying that the uh, placebo effect with antidepressants is like really high. Oh. Um, and he said that there's, it's almost the same, like whether somebody took the sugar pill or whether they took the, ac the actual um, antidepressant in six weeks the result was the same. And he said, the reason it took them six weeks is because of the belief, because what do they tell you when you get an antidepressant? It's going to take, right. well, I think it's six to eight weeks or something. So I am ready to hear the tools. Yes. Um, anytime you're ready to share, what is our starting point? Okay. I love it. So I'm going to leave you with a really easy way to remember the tools for emotional wellness. ABC. Can't get oh my any gosh. <laughs> right. We're going to start with A, which stands for acceptance. And this comes from the ACT literature, which is acceptance commitment therapy. And as I talked about a little bit already, we need to accept the full range of emotions. And we need to accept that vacillating emotions are part of being human. We don't want to be robots anyway. I mean, would you really want to never feel any emotion other than utter bliss? That would be a little bizarre and a little creepy, frankly. <laughs> So we want to accept that emotions are part of just the condition. But at the same time, we also want to look at our expectations and 
and, and dial down these unrealistic components where we think, oh, I'm just going to feel bliss, like I said, all the time. So one of the things we can do with ACT, though, is accepting that undesirable, uncomfortable emotions are part of life. And what we do to push through is that we look at our core values. Now, sometimes people wouldn't think that core values would be related to emotions, but they absolutely are. Let me give you an example from the ACT literature. Let's say that I am having this nervousness of like going to a party and really honestly, all I want to do is stay home and watch Netflix and pop some popcorn <laughs> and I don't want to go. Maybe it's a networking event. Maybe it's my husband's Christmas party with his business and I barely know those people. But my core values help me push through that emotion to take action that's consistent with my core values. So my core value here might be as much as it's really be more comfortable to stay in my jammies and hang out in front of the TV, my core value is I really do want to connect with people. I really do want to meet new people and see if I can be supportive to them and, and help them along their way and so forth. Or I really do want to be a good wife and support my husband. And so I need to push through my, my personal immediate emotion to align my behavior with my core values. And so that's where we accept it. We go, yeah, of course I'm going to feel nervous. It would be abnormal not to feel nervous to walk into a room full of people I didn't know. That would be bizarre. So we accept and then we look at our values and then make a decision that's in step with our, with our values as opposed to that immediate desire to just like hibernate for the night. Okay. So I love where you're starting out and um, you and I just have so much in common as far as what we're, what we are passionate about here, because absolutely. Um, I wrote a process called five steps to break through your breakdown and the research that I did really supports what you're saying. It's a different, it was a different type of research, um, but I love the acceptance and the part that I think is most beautiful about what you just said is that we have come in, we are human beings and we are here to experience a full range, a full spectrum of emotions. You know, we're getting, again, we're getting tricked to think we should feel happy all the time. And that's fine because you know what, being in that instaurer, empowered state of being, that's really the time to do your best creating. That's time to do your best um, manifesting. And that's the best time to take action. But however, if you're feeling more in that disempowered state, that's okay too, because guess what? We wouldn't have... Um, anger and sadness and depression and despair and worry and, and, and fear if they did not serve us in some way. And so we were built as receptors to, to experience all of these emotions and they're all equally valid. I think that another thing that we do is because we want to be happy all the time, we actually invalidate our experiences when we are not feeling happy. So when we right. don't line up, when we don't line up with that expectation to be happy all the time, we're actually bullying ourselves mm -hmm. and invalidating our experience. Like, oh, you know, I, I have this great job. I should be happy or, you know, but there's so many contributing factors to, to what we're feeling and we won't uncover those. You know, I love how Dr. Gabor Mate talks about, um, trauma, not necessarily about the importance of the thing that happens, but how it shows up for you in your present day moment. So mm -hmm. how is that thing that happened to you 10 years ago showing up in your present day? And so when you can process this, when you can accept these emotions for what they are and go through a process like this, it really prevents that um, PTSD from fully kicking in so that 10 years from now, you can still feel that range of emotions. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. And I mean, just think about, again, get, looking at the human condition globally, just think about, and this is maybe a funny example, but no joke, I am a songwriter and most of my best songs are from when I was brokenhearted. I mean, <laughs> like, I kind of like, I blame my husband. I'm like, I'm super happy and in love now. So <laughs> my songwriting's dried up. I mean, that's not totally true. I've written a lot of love songs for him. But really, we express, we emote, we create, even in those painful periods as well. And that's a really beautiful thing. And once we process, the literature does show us that we want to be careful, we want to process, but we of course don't want to ruminate either. So there's a tension there, isn't there? We want to process. We want to be honest about our emotions. We don't want to shame ourselves for feeling something that's not a mountaintop experience. Then we don't want to ruminate. And we want to, the, the final piece about acceptance is we want to kind of detach a little bit and sometimes look at our thoughts. 
So when we've had like, again, and I'll go back to some of my most painful moments were wicked, wicked breakups. And uh, I called off a wedding when I was 34, runaway bride, all this kind of stuff. You know, I had kind of a lot of heartache over the years. And when we feel that depression kind of trying to, that dark cloud trying to kind of settle in, if we know we've processed that and we know that it's almost like a default mode now, it's almost like this has become our natural state now is to get depressed. We can then start to be objective and that acceptance is like, I accept you, I see you, I see you wanna come, but I'm also going to take charge of you and go, you know what? I don't own a depressed identity. That's not, I'm gonna have depressed feelings from time to time, I'm human, but I will not own this depressed identity. So you kind of can talk to your emotions, detach a little bit and go, you know what? You're a feeling, I felt you before. I'll probably feel you again, but you will not overwhelm me. You will not take control of me. You will not make me make bad decisions. So you really have to get really cerebral, which I think, you know, from our conversations, I, I think that's the way your mind works too. And a lot of my followers are very much in their head a lot. So we want to use this, this analysis paralysis, and in this case, make an analysis powerful to where we can take charge of that um, of emotional state, accept it, look at it, detach just a bit, and then go, okay, you're a feeling, I get it, but I'm in control here. Which leads me to my second point, which is B is behavior. So ABCs of emotional wellness, B is behavior. Now, just briefly, because I'm sure your, your listeners and your, your viewers are very well aware of all the research. I mean, all you have to do is a Google search to see that being moved, uh, getting uh, active, moving around, and having an active lifestyle, of course, affects your emotional state. We know the endorphins. I mean, you just, again, do a Google search. I don't need to get into it here. So we know that that's a powerful way to affect our emotion. Once again, the whole body. It's not just the mind. It's the entire entity of the body. And so when we're moving, we are able to get those chemical endorphins released and, and get those chemical reactions. And so we need to take charge of that too. And that's something that it's easy to get once you're feeling down. It's easy to go, I don't feel like like, like moving, I don't feel like taking a walk, I don't feel like going out, I don't feel like calling a friend and, and having a cup of coffee. So sometimes we have to kind of fake it till we make it. Or a therapeutic technique is called acting as if, and it's an Adlerian therapy technique where we just go, well, what if I were a happy person? What would I do today? So we think of like, I feel like taking a run, so I go take a run. Sometimes we have to just reverse the trajectory. We go, I'm gonna take a run, because I know it's a good thing for me to do. And if I were a happy person, that's probably the choice I would make. And then we let the feelings follow. And we've all experienced that, right? I mean, like that was the worst workout and I feel worse that I went and spent 45 minutes working out, said no one ever, right? <laughs> I mean, no one's ever said that. So sometimes we have to put the action in place and let the feelings follow. Acting as if is one of my favorites. You just wake up in the morning, if I were happy, if I did, did feel fulfilled today, what would I do? probably take a shower, probably call a friend to see if we could grab lunch. Those are very powerful. They seem too simplistic really, but so often the most powerful steps we can take are actually pretty simple, not easy. I'm not trying to say they're easy, but they're simple. And there's, there's so many things. So like, for example, I love the simplicity of ABC. So A, acceptance, B, um, now I want to, I want just for clarity. So is B, be active um, or, or behavior. Or behavior. Yeah, and so tell. I wanted to throw out some other behaviors that will also create the serotonin and the, and the dopamine. Um, so one is having a gratitude practice will, will create a dopamine and serotonin in the brain. And I can, you can call these the happiness hit hormones. So the reason that exercise or movement is so um, powerful is because it does create those happy hit happy hit hormones. And if you're in that place, if you're, if you're too dark down there, and I've been there myself, where I can't even muster up the um, energy to go on that walk. And by the way, I found out later when that was happening to me, I had an underlying thyroid issue. So there was actually more happening to me from a neurochemical perspective than I even realized. Um, so uh, what, what, what I could do is I could still keep up on my gratitude practice. And that's another thing that when you have a daily gratitude practice, it will help you um, keep those keep the serotonin and the dopamine from, from bottoming out. So thank you for that. Are you ready to talk about C or do you want to talk more about B? Um, I'll just uh, piggyback off what you just said and then get okay. into it. Yeah, because I talk about that on my podcast. So I've looked at a ton of literature on gratitude and happiness and you're right. They always go hand in hand. 
Always, always, always. And the other piece that you talked about, and you're talking about the neurotransmitters, serotonin, dopamine. Again, in our misinformed culture, we are often led to believe that I'm feeling sad because I have a chemical imbalance in my brain. There is actually no literature to support that at all. Now, Big Pharma will try to tell you that there is, but that's not the case. What we see, though, is that consistent thought patterns, which will lead me to see, to see in a minute, consistent thought patterns can put grooves into our default mode of neurotransmitter activity. Just like if a river keeps going down a certain path, the river is going to get deeper and deeper. Those thoughts, those negative thoughts that we keep thinking over and over, reinforce the neural connection such that then we look at someone who's 28 and they've been thinking negative thoughts for the last 20 years. We do see a different brain pattern, but it's not because he was born that way. It's not because he had a, a chemical imbalance at birth. It's because he has been in that mindset. So that segues us into C, which is, so A, acceptance, B, behavior, and C is cognition, which uh, is just the psychologist's way of saying thinking. Thinking patterns, decision-making, uh, cognition has to do with mindset. So when we take charge of our thinking, we all know if I'm thinking happy thoughts, I'm feeling happy thoughts. I mean, that's a very basic thing. So one of the things that we want to do is to take charge of our thought patterns in a very profound way so that we can let the emotions elevate with our more positive thinking. Yeah, that's, that's profound. You know, um, I want to talk more about it because I like to get into the how to's. And so one of the things that I have always found is like understanding how each little choice that we're making, how it affects our outcome. So it's, it's kind of, it's a little, little different because you're talking about the cognitive process, but what I have found is, um, you know, I think that there's such a feedback loop between feelings, thoughts, words, and actions mm -hmm. that sometimes those, those, um, I call it foutoir, <laughs> feelings, thoughts, words, and actions, uh, <laughs> it can, it can really get out of alignment. In other words, your, uh, you, your actions, uh, might you want one thing, you feel one way about it, but your actions are the opposite of that or your words are the opposite of that. And if we, we boil down to sometimes I don't even feel in control of my thoughts, you know, sometimes I think my thoughts are actually thinking me and they're, they're really coming from out of nowhere, but what I can control is my choices. Yes. And so each time I make a choice that, I mean, I call it cleanse or clog. So whenever I'm making a choice that is cleansing me in my experience and moving me um, moving me in the direction of where I want to go, whether that be healing, whether that be something in my finances, my relationship, my career, none of those things really matter, which it is. But what does matter is to always be aware that my choices are my keys to freedom. Mm -hmm. So what, um, as far as that cognitive thinking part, do you have a strategy that you can share? Because one of the things that I've noticed is when I'm in the darker frame of mind, it is really difficult for me to make choices that support uh, the direction that I want to go. It seems like I can spiral into making choices that actually make things worse for me instead mm -hmm. of making choices that make things better or cognitively thinking about things in a way that's going to alleviate or you know, cause more frustration? What's your thoughts there? I have two ways that I think are really important. Um, first of all, self-talk is a very basic term in, in therapy. I'm a big fan. Now, acceptance, uh, commitment therapy I talked about earlier, they're more like, hey, just watch these thoughts and if they're out of step with your values or you realize they're negative and you're trying not to be negative, um, just kind of watch them. I'm a fan of actually like, putting on the boxing gloves. I like to <laughs> duke it out with myself. So I, and this comes from REBT, which is Albert Ellis's Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. So I like to unpack my thoughts and dispute them. And so when a negative thought comes into my mind, I like to just challenge my thought myself. So for example, um, you know, someone again, dealing with singles, uh, because I deal a lot with uh, single folks, one of the things that single people might think, I'm single now, I'm gonna be single forever. And it's easy to step into that. And then when you feel like you're going to be single forever, then you just give up and you feel depressed and you don't even try to meet anyone anymore because you're just like, I'm done. I, I, it's too painful to try anymore. I'm over it. But you realize that you've locked into and spiraled down into a very irrational statement just because you're single today. <laughs> it actually has no bearing on the fact that you could meet someone tomorrow or next month or next year. And so we really, and again, because 
like you, like I'm sure most of your followers, we're in our heads a lot anyway. Let's use that for good again. So really, I'm a big fan of disputing my irrational thoughts. Now, this came from Albert Ellis's own irrational fear. When he was a young man, he wanted to approach women to ask them out on dates, and he didn't feel that he was a stud. He felt like kind of a nerd. And so he started mm -hmm. to unpacking his own irrational thoughts. Like, so what if I get rejected by that pretty girl sitting on the park bench? So what? Does one rejection mean that I'm worthless, that I'm unlovable, that no one else in the world will ever love me? And so when you really start unpacking the loaded the, the meaning behind your thoughts, that's where the power is. Let me give you one more example. I know we're getting close to the end, but I want to give one more example. When something happens that is considered devastating, let's remember that the thought, that the, the, the event itself is not necessarily devastating or not. Someone could get a divorce. What's the meaning that they ascribe to the divorce? Is it, I failed. The marriage failed. I'm worthless. I was a horrible wife. I have, I'm used goods. No one's going to ever want to be with me again. Um, I have no hope, no future. I have failed in this cataclysmic way. Or I could ascribe the meaning to a divorce to be I'm free. I had the courage to step toward an authentic life instead of living in a phony marriage. I have a second chance now. I got out of something that was abusive, perhaps, that wasn't for me. Same event completely different feelings associated with the event because of the thoughts that we ascribe to them and the meaning we ascribe to the event. That's where the power is. And it seems again, almost too simple, but if we unpack that, and it's so helpful to do in the context of therapy, of course, because you have that sounding board and your therapist can say to you, here's what I hear you saying. Here's what I hear you thinking. And then you might go, no, no, that's a little irrational, is it? <laughs> there's no reason to think that way. I don't have to. There's, you can choose. We don't think we can choose the meaning of our events. We can choose the meaning that we ascribe to the events that happen to us. And, and also to, to add to that, I think something that's very exciting that I have noticed is when I look for the evidence um, that supports what I want more so than I look for the evidence that supports that I can't have what I want. So for example, and I know I shared, I've shared this story before, but for example, I, I would say often that for 10 years, I really had this burning desire to write a book, but um, I would always go around saying, I want to write a book, but I'm not a writer. And, you know, we're Words are such a really yes. an, a mirror to what's going on and your inner belief system. So yes. I don't, you know, when you hear me say those words, I want to write a book. It's like, you can see that written all over me, like my purpose, but I have a big problem when the next words out of my mouth are, but I'm not a writer. Well, what I noticed was that when I went to that first writer's workshop and I wrote a short story about my daughter who passed away and about raising my children and one of them is on the autism spectrum and then like paralleling that with my roller coaster journey as an entrepreneur, that my brain um, at the end of that week when I read the story to the class, everyone loved it so much. Well, what happened in here was that my brain saw and felt the evidence that it would take to change the feeling that I had about it. And that change of feeling changed the thoughts that I was having. The thoughts then changed the words that were coming out of my mouth. And that changed my behaviors, mm -hmm. which then within seven months, I had a book deal. So I feel like, you know, what you're saying is absolutely true. So I would say like you're, you um, detach from the, how did you say, detach from the judgment or the meaning that you're applying to your evidence, but also like, I would like to add to that, to look for evidence to support yourself. So what I'm doing now, and someone said this to me the other day, it was like, oh, Mary, you've done all this work and, and you've done all these great things. And internally, when someone says that, what was happening, I was, I was thinking, no, I haven't. I haven't really done enough yet. Like I need to keep, uh, keep this going. Well, sometimes that starts to feel like hustling. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And she kind of meditated on that and she goes, you know, it's not, you're going to continue to feel that way as long as you believe that that is what is true. Mm -hmm. And so I decided in that moment, okay, I'm going to make a list of all the evidence mm -hmm. that supports what she says instead of what I, I now have, uh, named this person in my head, uh, the tyrant. And the tyrant uh, likes to run amok. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, that's what I did. I was like, you know what? She's absolutely right. There's all this evidence. And I just need to focus on that evidence more than listening to this tyrant. Yeah. 
the tyrant needs to be kicked out, by the way. Right. And in psych, we call that a confirmation bias. So if I have a bias and your bias was, I'm not a writer. Mm -hmm. So because you were seeing the world through that lens, mm -hmm. that was your thought, your comp you would only find evidence that confirmed your bias. So you would have evidence of like, oh, remember that paper I wrote in high school or in college that I was horrible at, you know? So that's what you would remember. And it's even what we attend to in our environment and what we notice and then remember. So we have to change that, that bias. We have to change that thought. And then we start seeing evidence that confirms our new expectation and our new bias, so to speak. That's a great example of that. Thank you so much. Well, I know that we have a couple of questions. And so we had one come in actually before we started. So um, we are getting, I'm gonna read you this question and then I have one more. And then I would like to talk about how people can get the free copy of your book that you're so generously giving away. Okay, so this came in via email from Eric F. who says, focusing on the evidence uh, good advice. Is it wrong to hold on to an old memory? When I am at a low point in my life, I think about an old happy memory, which helps me refocus and move forward. Uh, is this a crutch or a positive way to keep moving forward? I thought it was a great question. Thank you so much, Eric, for sending that in. I love that question, but I just was like, like, oh my gosh, I don't think of it as a crutch at all. I mean, that's using, again, that's harnessing your cognition. In this case, your memories, that's part of your mind, mindset and your mental state for good. And it's kind of going back to that moment and just remembering. So for example, if, you, if you're feeling down now, you go back to that memory going, I, I can feel good again. I will feel good again. Remember that? Remember that time? And so that gives you, again, like you were saying, that gives you evidence that you can have that emotional state that you want to have again, that it is in the realm of possibility for you because you've experienced it. And then to expect that that's going to come again. I think that's a beautiful, I love that. I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I do. I do too. And I would add to it that um, reminiscing on special moments from the past actually recreates the neurochemical uh, chemical recipe, I call it in my book, it recreates the same um, warm, fuzzy feelings, which is supplying your brain and your, your body through your nervous system. You know, it's all about that mind body connection and for wellness. And so when you do have that memory, you're actually recreating the uh, same neurochemistry in your brain, which is why it makes you feel comforted because this relationship with this person or that moment on the dance floor mm -hmm. was very comforting and connecting. You know, I think that we don't talk about this enough, but we, we need to have more conversations about basic human needs. And it is a basic human need to feel connection with, with other people. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. And then there was another question about um, definitely love to hear Mary speak more about choices. So I can uh, do that quickly. And uh, then I want to pass it back to Dr. Karen here to tell us how to get this book. So um, in talking about choices, I feel like, um, oh, you know what? Actually, there was a second part to that question. How to maintain, okay, so the question was about focusing on an old memory. Is that a crutch or a positive way? How do we maintain that continuous focus? Say more than just a day. Um, so what he's asking is how do we take that good feeling memory and have it stretch out for a longer period of time? Well, I think what you just said is perfect. Um, you know, there's research that shows that if I visualize, I mean, athletes use visualization all the time, right? A basketball player is going to visualize doing free throws. There's research that if you, if you rig up someone's brain when they're visualizing shooting a free throw and when they're actually shooting a free throw, there's no difference. So the brain doesn't know any difference. So your point you made just, just a moment ago. So I would suggest kind of like your gratitude practice. If that memory is so powerful in elevating his mood, I would suggest he makes that part of his daily routine. Like you were saying, you know, when you were in your darkest hour, you couldn't even get up to go take a walk, but you could be grateful. And so mm -hmm. maybe make that part of your daily routine. You wake up in the morning, you have a little gratitude practice, and then let, let me take three, four, five minutes to remember that memory. So to, to your point, to conjure up the same neural neural activity that was happening when I had that experience, making it happen now, your brain doesn't realize that it's not happening now. Your brain's like, okay, cool, I'm feeling good again. I'm remembering this experience. It feels like it's now. So it's, it's, we minimize it, Mary, you're right. We minimize the power of those sorts of experiences and those sorts of practices. 
Well, and I think too, then we can go right back to your ABC process. Now I accept that I feel happy in this moment. Let me make behavioral choices that are going to continue that good feeling thoughts and those good chemicals. So in talking about choices, um, one of the things that, that I talk about all the time is cleanse or clog. And so it's really just this concept of understanding that infinite possibilities really are available to us. And, and we, you know, I was, when I was growing up, I, I was taught the concept of free will, two words, free will. I wasn't really told much about it other than that, but I, but I get so curious about what is this free will. And then we'll have a uh, new thought educators talking about like the power of now and being in this present moment. And then when they go that my brain goes, Poof. because when you're an entrepreneur, let me tell you something, you're always in the future. Your, yeah. your, your, your mind, it's, it's in the future. And so it can be difficult to bring it back to this present moment. But what I learned was that you're really, your power of creation is now because now is the present moment and it's the choices that you're making right now in this moment. Like our choice to do this interview today leads us to a slightly different outcome for the, for the rest of the day, you know, we're feeding off each other's energy. We've interacted with people. We've, we've given value and that changes our outcome for our day. And then the outcome for today can, can spin off for tomorrow, but every choice you make, every step you take, every word that comes out of your mouth, every um, part of your behaviors is either creating a deeper connection to what you want, or it's truly driving a disconnection. And if you can boil it down to that simple and say, will making this choice, whatever it is, go for the walk, go for the run, do the gratitude practice, eat the potato chips, um, send a nasty text message to your significant other, will these choices cleanse me or clog me? And then the trick is try to get about 80% of your choices. If 80% of the time you are making cleansing, connecting choices, 20% of the time you can still eat your cake. <laughs> People will forgive you if, you if you send the mean text message. But if more often than not, you're making cleansing choices, I truly believe that in a short period of time, you're gonna see um, major change. I actually just got a message um, on Facebook this morning from someone here in my local town. And she said, you know, she said, Mary, she goes, um, I really want to take you to lunch. I'm, and she really said this to me. It was so sweet. She said, um, I was so embarrassed before because I wanted you to go to, I wanted to go to lunch with you and I couldn't even afford to buy my own lunch. And I had no idea that she had ever felt this way. Um, Honestly, the thought never even crossed my mind, but she said, now I want to take you to lunch because I've done all the things in your book and now I have a new job and a new life and everything is changed. And it was all because of that power of choice. And so I think in every moment, understand that the choice you make right now is going to lead you down a different path. And sometimes we know we're faced with those difficult choices. And sometimes it even feels like there is no good choice. But I promise you, there's always one choice that's slightly better than the other one. So, all right, Dr. Karen, how do we get this book? Yeah, so I was running a promotion, so I'm extending it now because last week was National Unmarried and Single Americans Week. And I think Saturday was actually National Singles Days. These are days that and weeks that people don't really know about unless they're kind of in my uh, little world of, of, of encouraging and empowering singles. But yeah, so what I was doing, and, and I'm happy to extend to your viewers as well, is just hit me up on Facebook. Um, it just, if you don't mind following my Facebook business page, Dr. Karen with an I, K-A-R-I-N, Anderson, April, A, B as in boy, R-E-L-L. -L. And then um, sign up for my newsletter, Follow me on Instagram and Twitter. And then um, as a thank you for, for supporting me and on my social media channels, I will send you a copy of the book. Now, if you are not single and you're happily married, um, hmm. grab the book and give it to a friend. It's, uh, it's, it's the kind of book that sometimes people are like, in fact, I had a, one reader reach out to me and she's like, yeah, my mom bought this book for me. And I was like, mom, stop it because I'm fine. Because she was fine, but she was also a little frustrated about being single. And there's some of the cognitive stuff we talked about today. There's a lot of powerful tools in the book just to remain happy, hopeful, and positive, even if you've gone through a lot of heartbreaks, even if love hasn't worked out for you yet. And so, yeah, so if you're happy and, and in a good relationship, uh, grab a copy for someone who might 
be able to need it because uh, that woman I talked about, the reader, she's like, yeah, one day it was a lonely Friday night and it was sitting there on my nightstand and I was like, oh, I'll just read it. And then within a chapter, she was on board and understood that I was not single shaming. It was the exact opposite. I am proud of the singles. Um, um, me, myself, I didn't get married till 42 and I heard it all that I was doing everything wrong and I was too picky and I was too everything. And um, then I uh, basically wrote the book that I wish had been available to me when I was getting all that kind of negative messaging about why I was single. And so it's, it's truly a word of encouragement and, and empowerment. So, and just for clarity, um, mm -hmm. do you have a, do you have a link that leads to this promotion? Cause if you give that to us, what I can do is, um, or the exact instructions, because you know, if somebody, we went through that pretty fast, if you could send me the exact instructions. What I will do is when we send the replay out for, uh, the people who signed up for today, they all get a free replay of today's video. We can put those exact, exact instructions in the email. And oh, then for the Facebook live viewers, what I'll do is just put the exact instructions, um, in the comment section of the Facebook live. So just in case someone is confused because some people don't always understand like go to this page and yeah. but we can actually link the page for you and then all they have to do is click on that so if you wouldn't mind um, emailing those instructions over to us we'll get that all taken care of okay. so uh, thank you so much dr. Karen for being here today I really truly am grateful for our connection and just knowing there's someone out there doing the work that you are doing in the world I am so grateful thank you so much thank you it's been a pleasure to speak with you and uh, hope to connect again in the future yeah, and uh, thank you for all of you who tuned in today. So again, if you sign up for the Zoom link, what you do is the benefit of that is you get the replay, which is awesome. Um, so even if you weren't able to be here live, we'll send you that replay. And uh, okay, until next time, massive love. Bye-bye.